حبيبنا ومولانا محمد عبده ورسوله اما بعد فعلى امر الله من الشيطان الرجيم يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما all praise is due to allah and after that all praise is due to allah we thank him we seek help from him we ask guidance in him and we seek forgiveness in him from our own evils and from our own bad deeds anyone who has been guided by allah may be guided and anyone who has been misguided by allah you will never find a body to guide them either with us i believe with us that there's no deity worthy of worship except for allah the only one with a partner and i believe with us that muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is a servant and his messenger to proceed forward um you know in a lot of times when we're uh, reading the quran and this has happened from the very beginning uh, of the time probably during the time of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and after this afterwards that there's certain uh, qualities certain phrases uh, certain um, you know inferences that are being made that the time that they're being made they're probably not understood by the people but as the society advances as more research is taking place and for example in the uh, in the ayat regarding um uh, when the Quran when it talks about the um the in the womb um the flesh and how the flesh becomes a morsel and a morsel becomes baby all those things during the time of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam even you know four or five hundred years even after that nobody understood them but after science was able to understand what was happening in the womb you look back in the Quran and you say oh now I now I understand this and so a lot of times what happens is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning things and then later on so human society and time is understanding what was meant uh, from before and a lot of times you can also see that um, during the life of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam uh, uh, himself meaning that during the time that he was alive and even afterwards multiple generations afterwards there was really no study of this aspect of leadership there was really no uh, study of this aspect of how do you actually influence other people and this is a fairly new phenomenon that's taking place in the west happening in malaysia that people are really beginning to study this idea of leadership development what does it mean to be an effective leader not an effective leader what are the qualities you should have is it a nature versus nurture all of these questions that are coming up and a lot of times research is done and then you as you reflect upon it during the, from the life of our beloved messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam you realize oh mashallah he already had these qualities in him but as we're doing that one thing to keep in mind is that we can all use these uh, examples to be able to strengthen our faith not to have faith you see the difference you use these qualities you say if you somebody's doing research on on science or mathematics or those things and you look at it from the Quranic perspective and see oh that makes sense then that should be able to uh, to increase you in faith but it shouldn't be the main reason why you became a muslim in the first place and the reason why is because what science proves they can also disprove what mathematics can say logically is right can also eventually become wrong so if you base your faith on science or on mathematics or whatever is in the Quran then uh, you know 20 years from now 30 years from now when it's disproven what are you going to do with your faith so again this is a matter of having that faith and these things uh, uh increase your faith but they don't actually form the foundation of that faith so in this regard i want to give my khutbah today to keep that in the background uh, as, as i'm talking about it so a few years ago uh, i was at a conference and there was an expert in uh, sociology and human behavior his name was Robert Robert Cialdini and he gave a very very interesting speech and I and and I, and I, and I remembered it very well on how to become a persuasive uh leader how to become a persuasive leader i mean the prophet of allah some that's all he was doing was trying to persuade people to be able to believe in the message and although the ultimate uh, hidayah the ultimate guidance is from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that didn't diminish his role to be able to go out there and teach the message for that kid in a intimate way to 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 make the remembrance but you are only that that, that person who does that meaning allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides that provides that guidance yeah but he was tasked with with with, with this objective so uh, it was very useful information and this this uh, this dr sylvini has spent his entire life 
researching this area of sociology regarding this topic. Okay? So he listed six things uh, that one should um, do within their own lives to become a more persuasive individual. Whether that be a more persuasive leader, more persuasive speaker, uh, whatever it is that you're doing, six things that you need to do to be able to do that. And I was just sitting there, and this was a few years back, and I see it's still uh, very, very uh, um, relevant today. As I was sitting there and listening, uh, and the entire time, time I was thinking to myself, you know, about the most persuasive person that I know. The most per persuasive person that I know. Someone who had respect of the older people and the younger people and the people of the same age. Someone who, had, who was very, very shy, uh, but we overcame it, that shyness with the help of Allah SWT. And he took a simple message, very, very simple message, from the desert of Arabia, a, a place where you know the, the world at that time thought uh, um, Arabia was like a backwater. Nobody ever worried about Arabia at the time. And he took a message, very, very simple message from there, and he made it into a universal one with, within his lifetime and a few generations afterwards was pretty much in the majority of the known world. And how was he able to do that? And so I thought about that and I thought these are the type of qualities that uh, we have in our blood messenger. That's why Allah SWT says in the Quran, that verily the messenger of Allah do you find the most excellent of examples. And so as we do our research in leadership, as we do our research in persuasiveness, in sociology and those type of things, these things only end up proving what is already in my heart already, which I know that Allah SWT made the Prophet as an example for us. And he is the best of mankind, and I hope, uh, as, as I do every week, just to share my thoughts with you, so hopefully you can benefit from something that I also benefited from. Allah SWT also mentions in the Quran, he says, uh, who is better in speech than the one who calls to Allah, works righteousness, and says, I am those who bow in Islam. And Imam uh, Ahmad Asawi, who was a famous 19th century uh, Maliki jurist, he said about this ayah in, in, in the commentary, he said that it was revealed concerning Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the messenger, for only he alone was the one who was truly granted all of these traits. That the, the perfect embodiment of these traits that I just mentioned, that Allah SWT mentions, the best in speech, who calls to Allah, the ones who works righteousness, and the one who says that I am those of, of those who bow in Islam, the, the, the uh, epitome of examples that we have is in our beloved Messenger Islam. So in our lives, we can incorporate these qualities because our life is about da'wah, our life is about persuading people, not only in whatever we're doing within our work, it's about persuading our, our wives to love us. It's about persuading our children they should follow uh, um, uh, whatever we teach them. It's about our jobs to be able to persuade our boss that we should be employed. It's about uh, persuading everybody that you have within your life somehow or another, in one way or another, you're persuading them. Whether they're above you, below you, next to you, on the side of you, whatever it is. Uh, being a salesman, right, is something that you have to be able to, especially when it comes to the da'wah of Islam. We have to be able to learn how to be the most effective and the most persuasive with people. And so with that, uh, I will talk about six qualities that uh, uh, the Professor Cialdini mentioned, but we also see these in our beloved Messenger Sallallahu And it is something that, of course, at the time, Allah SWT, in, in his ultimate knowledge, he instilled these in the Prophet. The Prophet had these. Now we are beginning to discover what is it these qualities had and what made our Messenger Allah the best example that was given to mankind. So the first principle that is talked about is a principle of reciprocation. And this is the idea that being the first to give, being the first to give, meaning that, and, and this is giving of your time, of your money, of your expertise, of everything and anything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has endowed you with. Whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you, this is uh, the reciprocity is that you're giving before it's even asked of you. And you're giving before you even ask other people to give to you. And the Prophet ﷺ was the most generous of people, not only with his money, not only with the money, but as we know, when people used to speak to him, he used to churn his entire body towards that person to speak to them. And he never uh, said, you know, oh, sorry, I'm running out of time, I need to go do something. 
It was always, I have all the time in the world for you. You speak your mind, you do whatever, so he was generous with his mind. He was generous with his money. Uh, one of the things that uh, uh, is talked about in the, uh, in, 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 in the qualities of the Prophet وسلم, is that, you know, no, if it wasn't for la ilaha illallah, if it wasn't for the la ilaha illallah, right, no deity would they worship. If it wasn't for that no, no would not be in the vocabulary of the Prophet no would not be. That's how generous of a person he was. And that's not only with his time, his money, and everything that he did, he was the epitome, the example of this idea of generosity um, that, 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 that's actually there. And so, the, uh, the other example of this that, that we can talk about as is, is all uh, in, in societies is embedded with this culture, which is that you must return back what you take. You must return back what you actually take. And when the Prophet ﷺ was loyal to his companions, the companions reciprocated that with loyalty. Undying, unswerving loyalty to our beloved messenger. They gave their life in return uh, for them. And so there's actually, uh, on this idea of reciprocity, there's actually a, a very, very famous book uh, 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 written about the idea that if you're involved in networking or if you want to persuade other people, the first thing that you should do is you should give. And when you give, that other person is obligated to give back. If you just keep asking from people, if the Prophet said all he was doing was asking for loyalty, but never gave anything back in return, people would have, you know, within a few years, they would have scattered and they would have left. Because they realized that there's nothing that, that he can offer for us. He was only all he's doing is asking. And so when you give, you get more back in return. So this the first principle is a principle of reciprocity. The number two is that the principle that the Prophet ﷺ, uh, possessed was the principle of scarcity. It was the principle of scarcity. The idea that if you can't have something, you want it even more. Right? If you don't, if you don't have it or you can't attain it, you want it even more. And you can do that with your children, you can do that with anybody that's there. If you take something away, or if you tell this is like negative psychology, oh, you don't want to do that. And then you're like, oh, maybe I do want to do it. Or, or you can never achieve this. And you're like, no, no, I can't. I can't achieve that. So this idea of, of scarcity is something very, very important uh, that we have, that we have to be able to instill uh, into people. And this is something that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi had. Because getting the revelation was a very unique thing. It's something that he had that nobody else could get. And that is why um, during the time that he, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi was living in, in Mecca, that is why the elders of Mecca, including Abu Jahl, they, they knew that he, he was the messenger of Allah. They didn't know. And the reason why they didn't want to follow him was because of, uh, of politics, because of, 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 of arrogance, those type of things. Right? They didn't want to follow him because if his tribe, Bani Hashim, was the one that was given the messenger, what is uh, Ibn Makhzum or Ibn Umayyah going to be given? It became a competition. So they couldn't compete. And so that's why they never believed in the message. And so they died as non-believers to be able to uh, be able to do that. So the idea of scarcity, and even more importantly in this idea of scarcity, if you look at it during the time of the Prophet وسلم, it was the idea of Jannah. Jannah was a scarcity at the time. Because look at the, the descriptions of that in the Quran. Right? Now imagine a place in the deserts of Saudi Arabia where you are of Arabia, where you're dying of heat and you don't know what to do. And the scarcity that you have is what? Of rivers and uh, uh, gardens underneath which rivers flow. Couches to recline upon. People to serve you at your every willing uh, uh, beck and call. All of these things were something that they didn't have, but they wanted. It was a scarcity. And so they were, Allah SWT mentions these things in the Quran because he knows that the Arabs at the time would yearn for that. And so that's why it was mentioned in, in, in the Quran. And in fact, I would argue, right, that um, the Jannah that described in the Quran, if the Arabs were to be able to, you lift one of the companions and you drop him into a society today, he's going to think he's living in Jannah. If you just quickly look at the descriptions of paradise in the Quran, what the, what the Arabs didn't have, you have them today. Right? The Prophet, the, 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 uh, the, the companions had no concept of a, of a climate where it rained throughout the year and there was luscious greenness going, growing outside. They had no concept of it because they'd never seen it before. And in fact, even today, I have people visiting from Saudi Arabia, and you probably know some of these, 
they look at the greenery that's around us that we can take for granted, and they're like, wow, subhanAllah, I've never seen so much greenery. I've never seen so much rain. But forget about that part of it. You know, I'll just to reply upon how many the, 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 the companions were barely even able to have one couch in their in their house. How many couches do we have in ours? Fruits and, and, and meat of different varieties. Open up our refrigerators and see. We don't have chicken and we don't have beef and we don't have lamb. We have this leg and that leg and lamb from Australia and New Zealand and all of these different types of things. What are we describing to the companion if we told him this is how the way we live? We're describing to him his aspect of Jannah. And we have to keep this in mind. So the other aspect of, of scarcity that we have, and it doesn't, you know, if you go to a person now and say, you know what, in Jannah, you're going to get couches to recline upon. That person's going to respond back to you and say, well, I do that every day when I'm watching TV. You're going to have fruits and meat of different kind. Well, I have that every day. Right? All these things are no longer there. But there's another aspect of scarcity that we can actually talk about when you give, we're giving da'wah to people. And that is this idea, there's a principle of, of, of scarcity, scarcity that was research, research that was done. And what it actually talks about is the more people have, right? It's not a matter of gaining more. It's a, not, it's a matter of not losing what they've already gained. And that is an idea of scarcity as well. Is that after you have a billion dollars, it's not a matter of making that next billion, it's a matter of keeping that billion that you already have. It's a matter of keeping that house that you already have, not making, having an extra house that's actually there. So that, that the research showed the prospect of losing some unit has more value than gaining that same unit uh, one, 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 one more time. And what do I mean? Why, why am I mentioning this? Because in the context of the Prophet Wasallam, the loss of the good things in this life and the hereafter are very, very important, especially as we're living right now. So maybe in our times, the appeal is not toward Jannah, but the appeal is towards Hellfire. Right? If you don't do this, then you're going to lose what you have. And that the fear is more important than gaining even, even more. So a poor person that you're talking to about, about, about Islam, you attract them with Jannah. But a wealthy person that already has everything, you attract them with what? The, skin, the, the fear of losing it. The fear of losing whatever it is that, that, that they actually have. So you have to balance between the, the two. So the second one was the idea of scarcity. The third one is the idea of uh, authority and credibility. That if an expert says to you something, then it has to be true because an expert said it. Whether it's true or not, it becomes secondary. But because a doctor or a professor or, or somebody who's knowledgeable or somebody who's, who's been there and done that says something to you, then you have a lot more uh, credibility. They, they have credibility. So finding a third party to validate whatever is, it is that you want to convey is something that's very, very important. And we find that very, very many times during the time of the Prophet of Allah. You know, when the Prophet first began his message in Mecca, if you get a tally, if you started to keep a scoreboard of who converted more people, who converted more people? Was it Abu Bakr or was it the Prophet of Allah? You know who would win? It would be Abu Bakr. He converted far many more people in Mecca in the early days of Islam. He converted to Islam much far many more people than the Prophet of Allah. Right? So the Abu Bakr became that, that authority, that credibility that the Prophet was looking for. Meaning they were best friends. But Abu Bakr has a different status in, in, in Quraysh, different status in Mecca than the Prophet had. And so we have to be able to recognize that. So why is it that, for example, Ramad ibn As, right, how did he accept Islam? I mean, there's a long story that I want to get into it, but basically, Ramad ibn As accepted Islam when the king of the Najis of Abyssinia told him about the Prophet It wasn't what the Prophet said. It wasn't anything from another companion. He had to travel all the way to Abyssinia to escape Islam. He was leaving because he wanted nothing to do with Islam. He ended up in Abyssinia, he wanted to stay there, so he asked the Nejis, can you do that? And the response that Nejis gave made him understand what Islam was, and he became a Muslim. That is authority and credibility, that sometimes you need other people around you to establish that credibility that you alone will not be able to get in and of itself um, by, uh, by themselves. And so, uh, uh, this, uh, this idea also uh, is, 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 is that twice when the people 
didn't believe the Prophet in Mecca, right? So for example, during the Isra and the Maharaj, when he came back and he told the people, even the Muslims were a little bit shattered and said, whoa, what, what, how can you go from, from Mecca to Jerusalem in one night, go all the way to heaven, come back and be able to do that? And who was the one who basically kept not only the, the Muslims from being, uh, from, for, to being firm, but also gave a very, very eloquent answer to the Quraysh, it was none other than Abu Bakr. Right? And so the other part of this also is that part of this authority and this credibility is that you have to be able to uh, show some type of a weakness. That you're, you're a human being. That you're not above everybody else. That you make the, you know, you're going to be, uh, uh, have a weakness in those type of things. And so that is constantly something in the Quran that Allah SWT is telling the Prophet That you are no more than a messenger. Right? You're no more. You're illiterate. And uh, uh, Muhammad is a man like yourself. These are things that are only he. That, that the, the Prophet Allah SWT is making him to be human so that people can relate to him. So that people can see him as credible because he's one of us. And because one of the things that they could have done, what the Prophet Allah could have done, was that he sent Jibreel as a messenger. He could have just sent him as a messenger for all of mankind. But he needed to, and all the messengers were sent as a, a people of their own people, uh, have the same uh, kind of some you know the weakness from the weakness from the, from this idea of that you're no more than another man just like we are, and that is something else that's very very important. So all of these points, uh, all these points to a small weakness that the Prophet uh, had, which is that he's not an angel, he's not God with a small g, and people were able to follow him because of the strength of his personality, that he was just like us. That he was just able to be able to do that. Now, next one is consistency. Consistency means that you have to start small and you have to build from there, right? That you have to be persistent and you have to be consistent in whatever it is that you're doing. And all, all we can do uh, is work, and we have to have patience. This is something that has to do with, with consistency, and the success is from Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. That means we do, and we do it consistently. And the success comes from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, and He is the one the, uh, the, that that who is uh, the, uh, the, the the most patient. You know, the community in Mecca started off very very small. Uh, you know, it stayed relatively small for a very long, long time during the time that he was in Mecca. But the Prophet never gave up, and he never gave up hope, and just he kept doing whatever was necessary. And every time there was some kind of a, a fear or something like that, the Quran, Allah SWT revealed something to motivate him to be able to just keep that consistency going. He was consistent and unwavering um, during uh, 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 with the Quraysh, and they began to realize how steadfast he was, how he was never going to swerve from the message that he was given, and so that's why more and more people began to follow the religion of Islam. Now imagine, for example, when the Quraysh came to the Prophet and they offered him, they said, you know, if you want to be a king, we'll make you the best of kings. If you want women, we'll give you the best beautiful women of all of Arabia. We'll give you whatever you want, just give up this message that you're giving. Now imagine if the Prophet at that time had wavered just a little bit. They would not have had the same reaction as they did. Abu Talib, when he told them that, and when he gave that response back, that you know, if they give me the, my, the sun in my right hand, the moon in the other, I will never give up whatever it is that I'm preaching. Abu Talib at that point realized, man, this is serious. There's no way he's going to give up whatever it is. So he told his nephew, go and do whatever it is that you need to do. You're going to find me there to be able to back. Right? Consistency uh, is very, very important in whatever it is that we're doing. And so we, as we do more and more research, and we find out about the human psyche, we find out more and more things about what makes people tick, what makes people motivated, those type of things. Uh, we realize how effective our beloved messenger was, even in his power of pers persuasion. That Allah SWT chose him above all of us, the best of creation, to be an example for us in so many different ways. That we keep discovering them as more generations go by. We keep discovering well, what a beautiful and excellent example he truly was for us in this life and as a personality. May Allah make us of those 
who appreciate the blessing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us by delivering to us the messenger, messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the more we discover uh, the tools that we have to appreciate that, the more research is done in human behavior, we truly realize the, 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 the Quranic ayah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, verily in the messenger of Allah do you have a most excellent of examples, لَقَدْ كَانَ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا وَأَقُولُ قَوْلِ هَذَا وَاسْتَقِرْ وَلِكُمْ مُسْتَقِرْ الحمد لله رب العالمين السلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين so we've been talking about this idea of persuasiveness and persuasive speech, personality, and those type of things. And all of these things existed in the time, in, uh, in, the, uh, in the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and all we have to do is derive benefit from it. How do we use that within our own lives? Not only in our dealings with our families, our co-workers, but even more important than all of that is how do we use that in our everyday life to give da'wah to people about the true message of Islam. And there is no uh, better message than the message that you portray to other people about how you live your life. And so that is why the Prophet as I mentioned, as research is being done, um, this Dr. Sialdini came up with six qualities that all effective leaders have. Six qualities that all effective leaders have, and definitely if all of them have them, then the most effective of all of these who embodied all of these characteristics was our beloved Messenger وسلم. And so we talked about four of them. We talked about reciprocity, we talked about scarcity, we talked about authority, and we talked about consistency. And these are all traits that highly persuasive people have in, in, within, the, within themselves, and along with two others that I will mention late, uh, now in the, in the second khutbah, and we need to look to our beloved messenger وسلم, uh, as an example, and we find these same qualities, these traits, these principles uh, within him. Number five is the quality of likability. You have to like the person that's going to persuade you. That's a very obvious um, that, that, that's going to be there. And the one significantly uh, increases their rapport with another person by identifying a commonality between you and that person. Right? But, uh, identifying the commonality between you and that person. Uh, and so we do this on an everyday basis. I mean, I meet people, and the most effective networkers that are out there, the most effective people that can influence people, when they first meet somebody, they don't only ask them for their name, they ask them for their family, where they live, what school they went to, you know, who their friends are, and all you're trying to do is establish some kind of a connection. You know, oh, you're from America, oh, I'm from America too, and they might be from thousands of miles away, but hey, we have something in common. We're both from America. Right? Oh, you're from that family? Oh, you know my cousin, sister's daughter's next door neighbor's wife's husband is also married to that same family. You see, you're trying to establish that rapport with that person so that you can be able to gel with them and be able to be persuasive uh, with them. And we do this um, uh, on an everyday day, day basis. And the Prophet ﷺ was no different. Because to the Arabs, right, he would say that he was an Arab. And to the Christians and the Jews, what would he say? That he was Ahl al-Kitab. We're people that follow the same, same, same book, or the people of the book. And finding that commonality um, helped him persuade uh, other people and that Wasallam was not the superhuman. Right? Because he was able to become, as the Prophet, as Allah sent him as a everyday person, as Allah sent him as that, he could relate to the people and he wasn't a superhuman that nobody could could, could ever hope to achieve. He was the best of creation, but he was also that human being that people could relate to. And that he, if he could reach that type of success, and that purity, and attaining that pleasure of Allah, then we have hope as well. And so that likability has to be there as well. And the last one that Dr. Sialini actually mentions, as he pulled as many leaders as he could throughout his uh, uh, life and all over the world, was the idea of consensus, was the idea of consensus. The last principle, right? That people look to peers for answers that they are unsure about themselves. That people look for uh, answers that they are unsure about themselves. When everyone does something, you are more likely to do it as well. This is the mob mentality, 
right? This is, this, this is something that, that, that's actually there. So as long as the consensus is building around you, you're more apt to be able to go towards that consensus. You're leaning towards that. And so one of the obstacles um, of all of Arabia they had during the time of the Prophet was to become Muslim, was that everybody wanted to be an acceptor, but nobody wanted to be a leader. They, nobody wanted to be the first one to do it. They just wanted to follow. If, if they're going to wait and see, well, let's we'll see what happens to the Prophet Let's see whether or not, or, or at that time Muhammad, right? Because they didn't believe really Let's see what happens to Muhammad and how he does. And, you know, if he, if he wins, if he wins the battles and he becomes uh, uh, a, a victor, then I'll become Muslim as well. And if he doesn't, then that's okay because I never was Muslim in the first place. So that's what majority of the tribes actually did. How do we know this? Because after the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, which Allah SWT calls this a Fatman Mubina, a clear victory, this Treaty of Hudaybiyah that they signed with the Quraysh, what did that do to the Muslim community? It basically put them on an equal footing with the tribe in Arabia that was the one that everybody looked up to. And when you, when the tribe in Arabia that everybody looked up to, you signed a peace treaty with, means you arrived. Right? That's like saying, for example, and I, I, I say this very, very sparingly because uh, I, I don't agree with it, but for example, if ISIS was able to sign a peace treaty with the United States, somebody's going to scratch that and say, wow, ISIS has really arrived. You see, a small band of people that are no, nowhere are being able to take a world power and be able to be on equal footing to sign that peace treaty. That's why America is not willing to do it, for, for valid reason. But that's give you an idea. So when they were able to do that in the Treaty of Hodebiya, when the Arab tribes look around and say, whoa, well, now they've actually done that, then you started seeing tribes after tribes coming to the Prophet Wasallam, giving their allegiance and becoming Muslim. That's why that, that, that took so long. It was, it was a building up that was happening. But once one, the consensus was on the side of, of, of the Muslims, that is when, when Khalid ibn al-Wadid decided that, hey, there's no if we know that Islam is going to be the true religion. So we might as well become Muslim before it's too late. And so that's why he immigrated from Mecca to Medina and became a Muslim. Right? So when the consensus begins to build around you, you have to be able to build that so that more and more people begin to come in. More and more people begin to come in. And that's something that we have to keep in mind, even for ourselves. If we want to be persuasive, we have to get that consensus building. We have to get the, the people that are higher than us to buy in, then everybody else usually will also follow along. And that is also why when you look at the da'wah of the Prophet in, in Mecca, who did he go after? He went after the leaders of Quraysh. Because he knew if he convinced the leaders of Quraysh, everybody else will follow along. Right? And so in the same way, when we're looking to persuade somebody, especially about the religion of Islam, well, one of the things that we should do is we should always uh, focus on those people that, you know, if I get one person, then all of their Twitter followers will follow along. All of their YouTube followers and their social media followers will follow along. And so that's what you begin to do. So you give Dawa to the people that are of influence so that all of these things begin to, uh, uh, to happen. And so the last thing that I wanted to mention regarding this, Allah SWT mentions this in the Quran. The idea of consensus is mentioned in Surah Al-Nasr when Allah SWT says, إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْ وَرَأَيْتَ النَّاسَ يَدْخُلُونَ فِي دِينِ اللَّهِ أَفْوَاجًا Right? The verily, uh, um, verily the help and victory of Allah uh, will come, will comes, and you see the people entering the religion in droves, in crowds that are coming in. Right? That is the this consensus idea that we're actually talking about. So brothers, as we go along our lives, we need to keep in mind the principles of reciprocity, scarcity, authority, consistency, likability, consensus, all of these things within our minds. Allah SWT says, Verily, in the Messenger of Allah, you have the most excellent of examples. He embodied all of these characteristics to be able to go out there and give the da'wah, to make people believe in the message that he was giving, and for us to be able to be those effective Muslims who can give the same type of da'wah, to be able to have the same type of effectiveness, to be able to influence people, to become Muslims, to become better Muslims, and non-Muslims to become Muslims, we have to begin to train ourselves in these qualities that only now are beginning to come to light 
but those qualities that were already embedded in our beloved Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala at least of those who who listen and obey. I ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala at least of those who embody the qualities of our beloved Messenger to the best of our ability to achieve, try to achieve as much as we can of the qualities of our beloved Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fi akhirati hasana wa qina adabna. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad kama salliyta ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim fi alabi na kahin na kahin na kahin. Allahumma barik ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad kama barak ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim fi alabi na kahin na kahin. اللهم إنا نسألك إيمانا كاملا ويقينا صادقا وقلبا خاشعا ولسانا ذاكرا شاكرا وعملا صالحا وعلما نافعا ورزقا واسعا وتوبة مسروحة وتوبة قبل الموت وراحة عند الموت ومغفرة بعد الموت برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين